When, when I was uh, younger going to high school, we used to have this thing called Channel One Half that would like air in the middle of the day and it would be like all the news that like students could deal with. Okay. And I remember that I was always in a classroom though where they couldn't pick up the signal. <laughs> so they would just play whatever was on TV at like 1230 in the afternoon, right. Monday through Friday. And it always ended up being soap operas. And <laughs> the weird thing was yeah. I didn't watch soap operas, but yeah. I, I like got into that 30 minute chunk every day. And I would just like, I would not know what happened the 30 minutes before. And I might have missed something here or there. But like, I was always kind of like, this is the weirdest kind of show. And I don't know who likes it. And then, after time, grown, I've, I've grown to kind of understand it. But yep. never to the point of the film we're going to talk about today. No, uh, I think it's kind of gone away, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is definitely a satirical look at a soap opera show being very soapy. Yep. And I think, you know... We, we, in recent times, we've talked about films like Cape Fear, which yeah. have made us feel dirty. Hopefully, Soap Dish will make we'll us feel clean. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. And I'm Kyle from GoFilmReviews.com. We're talking Soap Dish. Let's get clean. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gilty. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and this was regarded as kind of like a below-the-radar kind of a sleeper hit. Um, it got critics given good reviews. Mm -hmm. It just got kind of lost in the shuffle of great films of 1991. Yeah, and 1991 is an extremely eclectic year. Like, I think what's interesting about going through them this month is being able to see films of completely different types uh, yeah. that we've kind of encountered on our journey. But one thing that seems Not pretty paramount is that the films... The comedic films kind of tend to lean towards slapstick. Like, that yeah. seems to be a very, very paramount of what 1991 was. And there's a lot of slapstickiness to this, more so than even, like, the uh, the satirical sense, to me at least. I would guard this as kind of like Network, uh, if you've seen your Network. But mm -hmm. Network meets uh, What's Up Doc by Peter Vodanovich. A lot mm -hmm. of slapstick, Network, and you missed it, you got this. Uh, what really drives the movie is a great ensemble cast. Mm. I, so, I agree, yeah. Uh, starring Sally Field in a very, I think it's kind of an unusual very loud Sally Field. <laughs> yeah, because even though she's done comedies before, and I liken her performance this to what she did a few years later with Mrs. Doubtfire, it's it's interesting because she is the, the lead star, but I also feel like she's kind of more attuned to playing the straight man character. Yeah. And so playing over the top is something kind of different for her. Uh, for those of you who don't know the film, the, don't know what the film's about, basically, uh, it follows The Sun Also Sets, uh, <laughs> yes. which is a uh, soap opera that's very, very popular. It's been going on for decades. Rises, um, and, and people are trying to get rid of its lead star because she's basically become a prima donna. Celeste, and, right. and everyone wants to do away with her so that they can be the star of the show. And I think it, it kind of takes like a satirical look as well as a little, it kind of leans a little bit towards black comedy, but not enough. Yeah, it's kind of like peppered a little bit of black comedy in. And I said uh, I like the reference of Network, because it's, it's a Network show, mm -hmm. but you throw in a lot of comedy. So you get a lot of, of introduction of, like, famous director Gary Marshall's in there. Um, certain scenes, well, you got Carrie Fisher, who yep. appreciates her. Uh, she doesn't get, I don't think she is in enough. You know, yeah. it, 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 it's, maybe that's the biggest thing that I look at with this film, is that I think Carrie Fisher probably understood the comedy bit more than some of the lead actors did. Right. Yeah. Because this kind of comedy, it, it reminded right. me a lot of A Fish Called Wanda. And maybe, yes. I mean, it's probably because of the Kevin Kline of it all, but <laughs> that's the kind of comedy that's being done in the film. Yeah. And Kevin Kline gets the film that he's in. Him, uh, Robert Downey Jr., and Whoopi Goldberg are both like, they, they understand like completely what movie they're in and the kind of comedy they're working with yeah. in a way that I don't feel the rest of the cast does to an extent. At least for the main cast. But you're right, Carrie Fisher and I think Gary Marshall would have added a little bit more if they'd been able like bumped up a little bit more to to kind of help support that idea. So definitely you have the ins and outs and the struggles and power plays, much like web network of people trying to move up and people trying to get an upper hand. You try Robert Downey Jr.'s character is trying to make it a better life for him no matter what decision is being made. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a yes man, but also trying to I love him trying to play all the sides. I yes. think that was what was most yes, funny was yeah. that when someone calls him on it, he leans into the skid. You know, there's that moment Some where... Bad, but, yeah, yeah, there's that bad. big reveal that happens where they're all, like, shocked and they can't believe it happened on live TV, and then he kind of leans into it by saying, oh, because of the, her prescription drug abuse. Like, he's got it ready and he's got it going, and it's it's a very Tony Stark-esque performance. I know we right, kind of yeah. equate that with Downey just... Jr. all the time now, but, like, yeah. this is definitely an early sign of, like, him being able to roll the punches... In, in a uh, you know speaking sense, so if you definitely like if you've seen or are familiar with a fish called Wanda, which is a great ensemble cast, you would appreciate, probably appreciate this film. I think Kevin Klein does an excellent job of what mm -hmm. he has. He's making fun of 
being a down and out actor, but also very selfish, trying to move on up. But he's yeah. taking a lot of the power plays away from Sally, and they have a different struggle. I I think that chemistry works. I agree. Yeah. I do. I I think it's it's there's a good chemistry to the fact that they both get along really well together. I'm sure. I'm assuming in real life because yeah. you can feel it during the moments when they need to, but they also don't. Don't, aren't too afraid to like get at each other too in their character roles. Uh, I think that the best scene in the whole movie for me is Kevin Klein doing the uh, death of a salesman <laughs> at the old folks home, basically. Oh, well, 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 um, yeah, you know, yeah, there's yeah. like the woman spills the, the coffee and he goes and he like cleans it up and she goes, you're doing such a great job. Like, it was <laughs> yes, one yeah. of the most frustrating yeah. scenes because you're just like, like my mind was exploding inside my head with like, why would you do this? Why are you here? But I understand that that happens. <laughs> I think the, the writing is uh, actually pretty good on pace. I mean, it's not been something like power for a standout, but for, for comedy, it works. That the punches, the one, two, threes, and you get the hit back, like mm-hmm. a lot of comedies. Um, so it was written by screenwriter Robert M. Harley, who did like Steve, Steel Magnolias, which is a kind of a uh, what we call it, girl movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then we have Andrew Bergman, who's very famous. He got his start right, originally writing the basis for Blazing Saddles, but continued moving on with other successful comedies like The Freshman, which made fun of The Godfather, mm. um, Oh God, You Devil. Uh, Fletch was a big hit with Chevy Chase. And kind of when he misses, he misses big, which, big trouble. Yeah, well... Yeah. Yeah, big trouble. We'll talk about that some other. <laughs> also, also, Andrew's also uh, Andrew Bergman has also been a director. So he written and directed like uh, what was it, like uh, Honeymoon in Vegas and mm. um, it could happen to you. Those are featuring Nicholas Cage. Mm, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I think his screenplay. Uh, I'm sorry, both the names there, uh, Bergman and Harling. Harling. Yeah, Robert. Harling. Their screenplay together, I think, uh, it works pretty well at. at Getting the the comedy bits to it, I just again I think that casting bit kind of hurt it here because I think Kathy Moriarty is a great usually villainess in in most other films. I mean, when you compare it to I think uh, one of my favorite villain roles from her is from Casper. You know, she plays the the woman who's trying to get the house, and yeah. I think she has a sensibility for high comedy, but I don't know if she plays it right in this film. I don't think Terry Hatcher really like pops off with any of her comedy bits. Elizabeth Shue's pretty good, but again, she's kind of. It, it, there's Stuck just like a wedging where they're right. like they're, those characters aren't really moving in the way whereas I think like that scene where uh, Whoopi Goldberg is you know talking about how, how can she write a character that doesn't have a head <laughs> and that scene for me yeah. was like uh, one of her best scenes in the film because she understood what how to do the comedic bits as they were written and again that's kind of what it comes down to with that fish called Wanda is all the actors in that film knew what movie they were in they knew how to play the comedy which was very tough it's a very tough kind of comedy because you're not really saying anything funny you know, I mean, really, you aren't. It's about how you play it, and it's there's yes. a level of, do I play it over the top, do I play it at the level, or do I find a place in between? That's where Kevin Klein is at his best, is he knows exactly how to deliver every single line. Like that one, uh, when he meets Elizabeth Shue, and he goes, oh, you speak very well for a woman. Like, he's, he's got it really perfect, because that line's not inherently funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to play Death of Salem? Well, yes, I do. That's yeah. Just perfect. Yeah. Perfect. We'll tell you where. You got, he, yeah. Kevin Klein's got the right beats for mm-hmm. this, and I think, that, I think this is came after he did, I think... Uh, January Man. So if you mm-hmm. like Kevin Klein, he does the same kind of thing in Fish Called Wanda and in this movie and in January Man. He plays it. He does loud. Right? Yeah, I would argue yeah. he's playing the same kind of a character in Wild Wild West, but the yeah. movie itself just doesn't match what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think a lot of times when he plays the comedic bits, he plays it well there. Yeah. It's just whether or not the movie he's in is the right fit for him there. Uh, one of the criticisms I kind of have of this film is the last gag of Kathy Morarty, that, that joke of, you know, the, yeah. the, the trans jokes. Uh, being punched last punch is just not going to work in this day and age and I think we need to find some other way to hit the punchline obviously they wanted to bookend with some kind of replacement but just using people that are trans as a joke and a punchline just doesn't work anymore for me yeah I think it works for the time period it's in in that I don't I didn't find it funny more or less but it was more just like oh but it worked in the time period I understand because that was a big that was something you did on a show on a soap opera when it started to falter. Yeah. Um I, I don't agree like that it would work anymore and and watching the film I I didn't think that it was funny. Like and maybe that's yeah. my main criticism of the whole movie is that I didn't laugh a lot during the movie. No, yeah, I don't think you're not moments. supposed to though. It was kinda like hmm eh. Yeah. But uh yeah you're right the the Kathy Moriarty reveal felt it felt just kind of like cheap at the same time. Just yes. even looking at it from nineteen ninety one it felt cheap. Yeah, I, mean, she, I like Kathy. We all like her. She's mm-hmm. doing a fantastic job of 
her trying to enabling and Robert Downey Jr. enticing, enticing, and him trying to get favors back with her. It's a good chemistry they played. I think they match up right with that. Yes, mm -hmm. but yeah, the falling flat at the end there it just doesn't get it. There's one great line in the movie of her of Celeste going into his apartment and you egomaniac. Well, I should be. You climb up the floor. <laughs> I got an American sweetheart climbing up the wall to see me. I should have me an egomaniac. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that is kind of that's probably where I laughed out loud the most. Is the dialogue, but the quirky slappiness, like Elizabeth Shue playing the doorman trying to get inside, it just doesn't. You get like, oh, yeah, yeah. it felt it felt like yeah. it was just in a different movie. It felt it felt like yeah. a melding of two films, and I think that I happens. think that's a casting thing more than anything. I think it's just people who were not cast right for it. It's a tough thing to find actors that can play to the cutesy comedy uh, without it seeming too cutesy. I guess yeah. you know it, it becomes yeah. almost you know mellow comical. You know, and I think that's what happens when you get. Two different writers, too. Two, 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 two different yeah. comedic writers. I didn't research if they work together or somebody did an original draft and somebody yeah, overwrite. So yeah. we don't know. When you get two different writers, it's sometimes their comedy kind of never. And I can see where some of it is kind of really sophisticated. Some kind of it's really dirty, raunchy. So you That's can, true. Yeah. yeah. So, right. It, there's a lot of misses, but I had enjoyed watching it. Yeah, I think this is actually a movie, and I, I think this... Maybe a hot take here. I think this is a movie ripe for a remake because of that reason. Because I think that they yeah. get a lot of the ideas right. And soap operas do still exist. People do still watch them. In fact, yeah. Michael B. Jordan, I believe, got his start on soap operas. You know, Young and the Restless is celebrating like 5,000 episodes. Like, these shows are still kind of on. I don't know if you'd have to angle it the right way. But I think like a reimagining yeah. of this kind of idea could work because it is very uh, comedic network. You know, I mean, like you pointed yeah. out, this is a very comedic network. Even so much that I think you could almost trade some of the dialogue at times between Downey Jr. and Faye Dunaway from yeah. Network, and it would almost, like, sync up perfectly, because one would play it a little bit more straight-laced, and one would play it a little bit more uh, goofy, but it is the same kind of a story overall. You can take kind of reshuffle of yeah. the characters, and maybe the, the Celeste character would be played by a male, and the stuff. So there's a lot of... You can jumble it around and mix it around and see mm -hmm. what happens. That's what I enjoy about it. You can, it's a jumble, right? It's a whole jumbling of juggling act. Yeah. And I think it's a collection of good comedy scenes and some bad comedy scenes. And overall, I don't know if there's more good or bad to it. It's just such a mixed bag of, like, some things worked and just some things didn't in the film. Um, but it reminds you of how Robert Downey Jr. got started. He actually was doing more comedy films before. Uh, that's how he got started before he did it. was an action star. Mm -hmm. I think if, if you want to research, I think one of the first action movies he ever did was Air America with Mel Gibson, which, oh, yeah. more, which still is kind of a f comedy, but yeah. that's him kind of bleeding into action. Um, and um, he got really praise and notoriety from playing Chaplin. Yeah, Chaplin, which yep. again uh, still kind of steers into comedy a bit because of how he has to play Charlie playing, you know, the tramp. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a good Chaplin is such a good transitionary role for him because that way you do get a sense of his dram dramatic chops, his you know more comedic chops, even his kind of action chops because you have to hit Mark so well. Yeah. And I think that's what he does really well in this film is that he understands the comedy that's being displayed, he pushes it forward, and he's also playing with every single person in the film, I think. Like yeah. he has he has great comedic moments with everybody. Whereas Kevin Klein is again kind of more focused on field and shoot. Downey Jr. is focused on everybody. He's working everybody. So yeah, if I had to do a Venn diagram of every all the characters, Robert Downey Jr. character would be in the middle. His mm -hmm. character would be in the middle because he's the connecting yeah, everybody. More right? so yeah. than any other role. If his didn't work, film is completely out. Like, it yeah. just would not even track because you need someone who's able to play that comedic role with every single person. And not only that, he changes the way he performs with every single person. Yeah. You know, because he really has no personality. Except, I mean, like all TV execs. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. There's a little bit of, I think, a little dampering of Gary, because Gary Marshall does comedy. Too. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of Almost like Gary Marshall probably helped out a little bit on certain things. I would I wouldn't be surprised if I find out that Gary Marshall did a little bit of directing in this movie as well. It's probably how he and Fisher ended up in the movie is they probably each touched up the script at one point, <laughs> right? Because we we know like Gary Fisher is notorious for rewrites or mm -hmm. doctoring up help surgery and doctoring up scripts, and Gary Marshall is also notorious for doing that. Well, as well, it seems like Fisher does it. Like angles it into getting a small role in each of these films too, because that's how she ended up in Scream Three. Like was you know, as she kind of like angled her way into being in that movie for one scene, she did some work on the screenplay. Like it, it's almost like maybe she kind of utilized like, well, I'll write some really good stuff that I can use <laughs> or something like that, yeah. because she always seems to angle a small role out of the film too. And this being the post Star Wars Carrie Fisher, 
she had to find you have to kind of maneuver a new name for yourself and hers right. was pretty much comedy and after this is uh, this was 1991 and the year before her famous book postcards from the edge became a big hit this is a year after that so in 1990 postcards from the edge came out and it was a famous book of her going through rehab in the late 80s after star wars and trying to get back in and i think the first movie she did after rehab after she wrote the book was the burbs mm -hmm. and the postcards from the edge which her, i don't think her mom really enjoyed <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's a successful film and then this movie as well so she's kind of bleeding back into the film industry yeah and I like that we, uh, you know, we mentioned this early on in the film. We had a laugh about this. The show being called The Sun Also Sets, <laughs> being kind of a playoff of Hemingway's The Sun mm -hmm. Also Rises, which is a very soapy. One, and I like it too. To the the difference in quality is if that book is rising, this is as far away from rising as you can get. This is setting. Like right, yeah. I like that the play is that it's completely the opposite of the great work of art. It is. It is right. Yeah. Yeah. It would be like the horrible Gatsby or something like that. Or the, yeah. Oh, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the other things that happened with this film was because this film went through extensive reshoots, Kevin mm -hmm. Klein had to back out of appearing in Hook. He was going to actually play the Robin Williams character in Hook. He had to back out and Robin Williams was brought in to that role. So it's I want to extrapolate and just think, can weird. you imagine Kevin Klein in Hook? No. <laughs> no. Like me not being a fan of that movie... I still think Robin Williams is the perfect performer for it. So it's yeah. very interesting that they kind of played into what uh, a lot of people from that time period consider a, a classic of children's cinema. Yeah, so for me, it's a it's a mild recommendation. Some of the stuff is a little dated. Um, you, it's a little bit kind of a time capsule, kind of a comedy film. Um, some of the jokes kind of fall flat, but we like everybody that's in it. I think, I think that, again, there's... Everyone is putting their forth their effort in this film. I just yeah. think there's a few people that get it and a few people that don't. And yeah. for me overall, I don't think I'm going to recommend the film. I'm kind of the same as you, but just on the other side of it slightly, where it's like, I don't know if I could tell someone to watch the movie. Right. Um, there, again, there's some good scenes, but you really have to be invested. I almost would like to get a person who's like addicted to soap operas to talk to them about right, yeah, the film yeah. and really see like how they view it. I think it's probably a little bit closer to that if you're willing to have a laugh with the things that you enjoy. Um, well, well, the big, so the big joke is supposed to be very soapy, right? Yeah, and I think that's what I really liked about the screenplay was that they weren't afraid to say the drama outside the show is just as strong as the stuff inside. And that line where Whoopi Goldberg was like, I can't go my crap this good. Like, it's, <laughs> it's a great, like, it's a well-written screenplay with, that just has a, a few bigger names that don't need to be in the film because they just don't match what they're supposed to. So for me, it's kind of a miss because I don't think I really found it, you know, throughout comedic. It was more just like, hmm, that's good. Like, there was a lot of things I appreciated about it. I just didn't really find it funny. And it's not even for the, the, the ending, as it were, because I try, I try to see everything kind of like, you know, I, I try to see any joke as being a possible funny joke. No matter how offensive it is, no matter how inappropriate it is, I try to look at it as far out as I can. I mean, I'm the guy who talks about his favorite comedy being Animal House, so I know about problematic jokes. Yeah, um, there's a lot of... Yeah. yeah. There's but, a lot of good hits and misses. But. Yeah, and like, with this one, I... I can appreciate the attempt at comedy. It just flat out it doesn't even work. Even even if, if it's inappropriate, it doesn't even work, the comedy that in that moment. So for me, kind of a miss. But I do think we're both kind of split on the film. Yeah. There's some things to like. There's some things to not like. Uh, the question is, I guess, what do you guys think? Uh, comment down below. Let us know your thoughts on Soap Dish from 1991. Uh, you know, have you seen it? Are you a fan of soap operas too? That's kind of what I want to know is people who have been fans and have not been fans of soap operas what did you think of the film because that's kind of an interesting idea is like does it translate to people and i think it's a, definitely an age thing i think mm -hmm. anybody born after 1991 wouldn't really underappreciate it as much as people that were alive at the time yeah, i don't really know what yeah. the current state of the soap opera is like i'm right, not really yeah, like yeah. like what are they what are they reaching out to are they trying to reach to younger audiences i don't know i haven't been reached at so i don't really yeah. i'm not 100 certain but you know we like reaching out to you guys with our content yeah. too so don't forget to like this video it really helps yeah. us out in the algorithm it does it really does um, yeah. and and subscribe we, we got two episodes a week coming at you and you don't want to miss either one of those so go ahead and subscribe as well and while you're subscribing, consider checking out the Patreon. We got a link down in the description below, patreon.com slash kylenickonfilm, and you guys can see how you can help support independent content creators uh, and get the conversation going more, help us choose our themes, help us choose our movies, um, help us develop uh, more content for you guys to watch. There's a bunch of movies out there you can pick from. Yep, and there's only so many days. So we gotta, we gotta you know, pick and choose what we're gonna do. Yeah. <laughs> but once again, guys, uh, I'm Kyle Goth. You can find all my film reviews on GoFromMovies.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for watching.